Namaskar. I think, first of all, greetings to all of you on the Guru Purnima occasion. I think all of us are teachers and all of us are students. I think all through our life we are students and so is a day to actually pay our respect and to our gurus who have, who have taught us all through our life. And also let me thank Prasad Prasad to really invite me to deliver this lecture, Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Lecture. And it's a great privilege for me to deliver a lecture named after our first Prime Minister. In fact, if you look into it, the many of our scientific infrastructure today, the research infrastructure today that we have, that came when Jawaharlal Nehru was Prime Minister and many of those are uh, as an outcome of his initiatives. So it's also a privilege for me to talk about AI in agriculture, which is actually coming in a big way globally, not just in India, and uh, in, in his memory on a special day of Guru Purnima. I hope I'm audible at the back. Yeah. Hmm? Is it a slide show? The microphone is a huge problem. Beach me are ready. Okay, as it uh, being set up, let me just talk without the slides. The point is that today, why are we talking about about AI in the space of agriculture? And in fact. Uh, Secretary Baird and DG very clearly pointed out that today the whole demand and requirement is for data and the quality data, reliable data, and data with complete confidence in terms of storage. The other part which also comes with data is protection of data. So therefore, the entire data infrastructure is actually will define the future policy, prosperity, and growth of a nation. And if we talk about the water, oil, as the basic necessity for growth, today data has become actually a necessity for growth. Therefore, a country which has got the best quality data in terms of all its attributes, properties, and origin can really drive the world in terms of technology. And for driving that, actually, if you look into it, the key point which is, has come up is the tools. In fact, all of you already, you have a cloud running, which is serving across the country. And so the entire big data framework, which is very, very essential today, is actually a backbone to AI. So why I started, I picked up AI as a topic because it's actually interfaces with the big data infrastructure with which you are working with. And in fact, today, if you look into it, uh, in many cases, the whole database technology has also changed. But instead of looking into relational data and the structured data representation, if you look at this MongoDB and this, uh, uh, this kind of a big data database systems, which can actually store unstructured data, 
I can have a variety of information in the database at a given point in time. And that is a value because it's not just the numeric data that I can work with. I can also work with symbolic data. I can work with different kinds of data types. In fact, in terms of even documents, at the same time with the numeric data for generating insights and analytics, which is being enabled by AI. So therefore, diversity of the data, the, that is really the today's challenge. And to get reliable data, we need to have diversity associated with the data, and not just the numerical data. So for example, uh, that point which was being talked about, the rise being measured in terms of paddy crop or the greens. Now, both the data can be actually stored in a very unstructured database, which is today MongoDB is an example. And all of these enables us to look at, from an AI perspective, the validity of the data, as well as their associations with different physical observables. So therefore, AI has to be there to work with that kind of a database to generate insights. Because if I have uh, uh, billions of data items, and in terms of, uh, if we talk in terms of petabytes, even beyond that of the data, it's not possible humanly to consume the data or use tools, which is through an interactive process, we can use them. We have to go into a different level of algorithms. And that's exactly the big data challenge. And AI interfaces with that big data challenge. Although it doesn't really address the big data issues per se, but when we're looking at it from a statistical institute point of view, there's also a huge open issue. How do you actually map all of these computation in the context of a big data storage system? So therefore, that's the key point why, why we are looking at this whole point. Uh, let's look at today's key AI techniques, technologies. Is there any question? No. Uh, in terms of technology, say machine learning, deep learning, all of us know, and actually that is being used also for that uh, disease identification through the app on the basis of that uh, more than 50,000 images against the natural background. But today, a major AI initiative is, and technology breakthrough is generative AI. And generative AI as, is actually changing. In fact, I just gave the example of chat GPT-4 I think when reading newspaper reports, yourself might, might be trying it out. Your uh, young son, daughters must be doing uh, things with that and coming to you. But chat GPT actually is a revolutionary step in the in the AI tools coming to the public space. Well, and yeah. Ask, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I shall maybe to the, to the end, I shall try to answer. So chat, chat GPT is actually use of generative AI. And what is that, what it does? Actually, the whole challenge is because we have to understand that very well. Because tomorrow's all kind of services that we are really talking about today on the app will move on to chat GPT platform. And if we do not make an initiative in that direction, actually, what will happen? All the multinationals will come in take your data and put it across similar platforms and make money out of it. Okay, so this is also something I, th I think it's very, very important for a lab like ISRI to look at and understand. The problem of chat GPT is chat GPT makes use of a huge data and the context. The meaning of a word on the basis of which it generates an answer, the meaning of a word is generated on the basis of the context. And it's a linguistic context, which is gathered over the textual data available on the web. It doesn't get into the semantics. I think this is the fundamental problem I think all of us should understand of the, this kind of a big data and the AI with the big data. It doesn't understand the semantics of that word. It just looks at the semantics of the word with reference to the context. Semantics comes from the grounding of that word. If I look at a rose, or if I look at Paddy, I have with my concept, what does Paddy really mean, okay? But it's not Paddy in the context of uh, other words with respect to which it's occurring. 
So therefore, if you now ask for an advice, in many cases, you get hallucinations. Because Indian data or Indian context are not very well represented on the web. And it's actually searching on the web and generating the advices. Now, these technology we need to master. And it's not very difficult to master. But then you have to actually put in certain constraints, put into a closed domain, and move into closed domain. You can even now use a generative uh, technology for doing agriculture advisory in any Indian language. And I think this is actually a very interesting problem to look at for all of us because this can change the pace of service delivery in the country if we can bring in the service deliveries in the Indian languages and, and with reference to queries. Today, most of the chatbots are fixed query based. But this can be an open query base. It has to have a background knowledge. So whatever you are doing in terms of your uh, disease diagnosis, that whole thing can be put onto an image-based chat GPT platform. And that, that can actually enhance the entire power. In fact, the point you are telling that it should be expanded on many reasons too, should be done, but should be done aligned with what is today's state of the art AI. The other interesting thing is probabilistic causal reasoning. We have seen enough of machine learning. And machine learning has developed, we continue to develop. Generative AI is also a consequence of machine learning. But we all understand the causal reasoning. And the fundamental problem of AI today, I shall just come to it, is lack of explainability. We typically talk about we typically talk about AI, but do we trust AI? The trustability of AI is a big global issue today. And when we actually take this to the services, and if I work with any end user, so say for example, a medical practitioner, if I'm trying to provide an advice through AI to a medical practitioner, and if I try to provide an advice even to a farmer, the question is, it is always AI can work up to a certain percentage of accuracy. That may be 98% by 99%. But when that 2% error you use for 1 million queries, just look at the probability of the mistakes which can occur on field. And if somebody takes up that advice, and takes a step and then he suffers, could become responsible of that suffering. In fact, in fact, we, we go gung ho about AI, but I, I'm just talking about something slightly from a different perspective because these are the emerging issues of AI, and we should be very careful about them when we are talking about AI. So, therefore, the question is: can I provide a, an explanation of why I am giving this advice? If I say that, therefore, this explainability is something very, very important. Bias is everything is bias has been talked about in a big way. All of us know bias. So bias is also with reference to the data. When we talk about, say, we have trained with huge volume of data, is there a regional bias? Now, that bias have to be also statistically analyzed. And in fact, in statistics, there are various techniques to know whether distribution is biased or not. And so therefore, when we are using it for training, we need to address these questions. Because if the data is biased, my recommendations will also can become biased. And the robustness, what I said, is a stable in the sense that uh, safe and secure and not vulnerable to tampering or compromising the data they are trained on. So in fact, that is exactly the big challenge today. I may train a network, I can have the weights, but these weights can be manipulated on the database. And this can be a cyber attack. And that can actually destroy a various kinds of, uh, even the confidence into the system. If there is a, a, a kind of a commercial competitor to me, he might try to infiltrate and without my knowledge, can force my system to give advices which are not correct advice. So my credibility in the market would go down substantially. Now, these are all possibilities. Okay, As the AI is improving, people are learning to play with it. 
So therefore, explainability is important, as I talked about, that I should have an ability to explain. The other important is, I think, there has been also reference to the, uh, the drift in, in the discussions, that is non-stationarity over space of the statistical data. Now, non-stationarity of the distribution is a fact. If you see, because of the climate change, any kind of agricultural data that you get will suffer from non-stationarity of the distribution. The distribution with respect to which I have framed for an advisory, it is about the first few years. But now, because of the climate change, the lots of things, the temperature profile, the rainfall, lots of things do change. When it changes, my classifier actually fails. Now, non-stationarity of the data is a very, very fundamental problem. Uh, when we are using variety, variety of sensors for doing any kind of predictions, even in case of uh, medical applications, economic applications, agricultural applications, in terms of even standard computer vision-based applications. Okay, So why I'm telling is these are the open issues, I think which is very, very important for us to address when we are talking about the agricultural point. Then also it becomes the uh, integrity, that is, security, reproducibility, explainability, and consistency. Because these are today, what is important is that when you really bring out a service, a, a commercial organization will go through all of these, the rigorous analysis and testing. And that is something very, very important because without that, credibility of any service that we build on AI really doesn't get established. In fact, if you look at for these globally, in fact, FDI, when they approve any of the medical AI applications, even Europe, European Union also talked about those standards. Those standards are pretty rigorous. And those rigorous standards is what is essential for us to look at and adopt when we are moving into AI. In medical space, although the AI which is being used in many cases, it's a, it's a kind of a augmenting the doctor's capability. Because finally, we say the decision is of the doctor. Okay, These are the suggestions which are coming to the doctor, but final decision will be his experience. And he can actually make use of AI, can refer to large number of cases which himself has not been exposed to. But when the AI decision is given to the end user, there has to be many more protections built into it. But today, with the data and other things coming in, these are uh, so these are some of the things to be looked at. And as as we is being was being talked about, this digitalization is today a major thing today. It's not digital, it's not digitization, but digitalization. Now, what is the difference between, I think all of you know, but I'm just repeating for completeness sake. Digitalization is digitization of the processes. Digitization is just digital form of the data, digital, digital form of an observation. But digitization is actually a complete Processes. So when you talk about data-driven technologies for managing resources in highly optimized, individualized, and intelligent and anticipatory fashion, so therefore the whole pipeline is becoming digital. And that's the key point in terms of digital architecture today. And in many cases, we would like to have operations in real time in a hyper-connected way driven by data. What does mean hyper-connected way? Because it's not just a one point data source is coming to me. If I have multiple sensors, multiple agencies making observations, so I should be connected to all these agencies. And that connectedness, a hyper connectivity, gives me a data ecosystem which is much more richer, and we should be in a position to use that ecosystem. So, different fields, crops, and animals, diversity accurately manage to their own optimal prescriptions. So I cannot repeat that. So the point is that if I have to really address the non-stationarity, I have to be location specific in terms of my advice. And the locational factors can vary from point to point. So this cannot be an universal practice per se. 
So digital agriculture AI tools deals in anticipatory and adaptable way to changes such as those caused by climate change. And, and in fact, globally, AI applications in terms of any of these issues, climate change is becoming a major factor to look at. Because your, your uh, different pay, uh, pay, pests, which comes in at different points of time, there is a shift of the time also because of the temperature change, because of the humidity changes. And therefore, how do you take care of those things? Because these are, these are therefore, this is a problem which is requires, therefore, the data collection. So what is being talked about is the huge volume of data which is available and data through multiple ways, IoT, uh, internet, simple mobile-based sensing, then other, these phenomics kind of uh, experiments, the setups that we have, everything put together, we need to look at this data. And this data is a key for AI. And therefore, real data and good data is something which is very, very important. Now, uh, and it's being stuck. Hmm. Somebody is just hmm. that was it. Skill them. Yes, that PPT was on. No. Huh? To share the NFC. Is it? Hmm. Huh. Okay. So I shall try to talk about briefly this computer vision for phenotyping, additional agriculture analysis and causal drilling for agricultural recommendation. I shall not go, go into details in the background. I shall just touch upon them. So if you look into it, this planned phenotyping, in fact, the entire infrastructure which has been created at IRI and we, we have worked with it and uh, setting it up the imaging thing. It, it provides us a tool for planned phenotyping. There are hundreds of AI applications. Phenotyping is one such application. And in case of phenotyping, they refers to obtaining the observable characteristics or traits jointly affected by their genotypes and the environment and is formed during plant growth and development from the dynamic interaction between genetic background and the physical world in which plant develop. Now, why I use the word explicitly is because this phenotyping is also a function of your change of climate. And therefore, these entire observations and measurements that has to be done, that has to be factored in with reference to these kind of drifts which can come in. Although most of the work which has been happening, in fact, is in the image space, and this is the basic flow. If you look into it, that image acquisition, uh, processing, segmentation, feature extraction, and classification. Now, these features that we use extract, that becomes impacted by the changes in the climate. So the point is what we can do at one point, the other point is may not be always usable. Okay. So I shall talk about not just a classification, I shall show that how things can happen. And using simply a Leaf-based phenotyping. Maybe there can be root-based phenotyping. There can be lots of other options. I'm not going into that. I'm just picking up, if you say leaf-based phenotyping, the plant leaves are the primary source of various phenotyping traits and leaf area, conductance, as well as compactness, as well as, well as counting the... There are a number of applications in which they are there. And if you see physically, that whole setup is talking about 
the different features of the leaves that are to be used for the purpose of phenotyping. So now, therefore, one challenge is what? One challenge is how do we extract these features using AI? And that area of AI is what is we talk about is computer visions that we use. So take this, take for example, this one that detection and segmentation of microstructures of such as stomata cells require robust algorithms to handle low contrast between the background and the cells and varying degree of occlusion due to presence of other micro objects. And this is when we take uh, a stomata and actually go through this microscopic imaging and the data that we see that requires uh, various kinds of processing issues. I'm not going into this problem solving and just putting it across the challenge of computer vision problems which comes in in this case. Look into another example. This is in terms of uh, leaves, okay? So if you see the leaves and the nature of the leaves and the disease manifestation happens in most of the cases for the leaves. So how do you segment the leaves? How do you look at them? And even uh, and, and looking at multi-level leaf structures, not only at the leaf level, but also at a canopy level. That gives different phenotypical measurements that we can do. And what is very, very important and interesting is uh, the challenges of deep learning based techniques because you need data. In many cases, we really don't have the data. That becomes a challenge and that requires also you to develop new technologies or new approaches where you can work with a certain set of data and you can keep on improving the system as you get more and more data. And multi-level is, is in terms of uh, planned architectures. So for example, if I have planned architectures, how to deal with it? Now, all of these, many of these have been done and is being done in a manual systems. But the key point which comes in here also, that how do you use computer vision? That is, this, this, this is an, a kind of a cartoon representation of various kinds of imaging setups that we can have and get the data. But now these are more in terms of a lab level data and lab level formulations. But the key point is to look into what we do in the field. And in the field also, what is today advantage is, in many of these cases, what we're showing as multiple cameras around the cameras, our mobile can actually provide those multiple cameras. And today's computer vision techniques based on AI has become powered enough to take care of uncalibrated camera and different orientation and create the correspondences for doing computer vision based analysis. Some of the examples, see deep learning, I think uh, I just, I'm skipping this, I think is must be known for many because if you see a very simple way, why really that AI came up is because I could have multiple layers of neural networks. I and mean, then you've heard of the neural networks and because of the ReLU and computation, I can use multiple layers and that's a standard uh, convolutional networks, which makes use of convolution as a basic uh, signal processing function. Now, why I wanted to show this is that how these different disciplines come together. We are talking of AI, but basic input is raw data. Raw data in this case are the images. We use signal processing, which is essentially a convolution operator. We also learn how to do convolutions through deep learning. So the core classical algorithms themselves have changed because of AI. And that is what is impacting these all, all of us. And that's why those other concerns which has emerged we need to address very significantly. So look at one of these deep learning application that uh, based on these aerial images. In fact, this work has been done uh, with, with help of uh, Dr. Sahu and his drones and other things. And I wanted to just show these results. Now, if you see the pipeline is, this is an aerial image. The, I need to actually segment out the leaf. And based on segmentation of the leaf, I need to look at the leaf area, so red areas of the leaf. And if there is a disease area, the disease area has also to be segmented and identified. Now, this is, this is essentially the recognition part. There is also, uh, it's essentially the computer vision part. There is also an inferencing part following this. So if you look into it, the approach wise, I just look into the architecture. If you see, it's a, it's a complex deep learning architecture. And in this architecture, there is the region uh, networks, which actually proposes the regions, which identify the regions, which are leaves, 
in this case. And based on the leaves that you detect, so therefore there are multiple stages. As we say, deep learning is what? Layers of convolutions. You apply one convolution after one convolution and so on and so forth. So overall, the complete pipeline of convolutions will give me the leaf areas in the image. But at the same time, if I start taking features from each of the convolution layer, I can use that to recognize a disease region on the leaf area. So it's a kind of a multitasking learning framework. Now, why I'm showing is that here also, there's a huge opportunity of innovative algorithm development for identification of disease areas when you're looking at from an aerial image just for the distribution of the crop field. Uh, so if you see that different data and different identifications which come up and, and see the cleanliness of which the cascaded results gives me. Because this clarity is what is very, very important. So that this is something which is uh, which uh, which is a step towards the actual diagnosis of the disease, and this is if you see on a general background using a drone image, and so you can do a a biggest big statistical study based on this pipeline. <laughs> so the microscopic plant level analysis. This is kind of a canopy architecture because canopy architecture. See, the point is, one is disease segmentation and disease identification uh, I had looked at. Another example is the canopy level architecture is also, an, also a reflection of the plant stress and, uh, and various other factors which impact plants' growth. And how do we analyze quantitatively canopy? I think this is actually a major challenge, a quantitative analysis of can canopy. What we did was we used uh, a deep learning based framework and just uh, and this data was this data was collected from the phenomics facility here. The ruby crops and at various points in times and seasons, this data was collected. And I shall not go into the details of it. I shall just try to explain what we are actually done. If you see, uh, we did what is called from these data, what is called 3D from motion. So if I take a camera and around the one plant, I move it around, I get 3D, I get multiple images which represent my motion. So since I get multiple views, I can actually extract what is called point cloud representation of a plant. The point cloud captures the canopy geometry. Just consider that there is a plant and a plant has been represented by 3D points in the 3D space. So if plant has been represented by 3D points in the 3D space, the distribution of the points really represents the canopy structure of a plant. And therefore, the point comes up is that if I can create, there are algorithms, very sophisticated algorithms, the structure from motion algorithms based on that, we create, this is a pre-trained model. With that, we create the 3D 3D plan models in terms of point clouds. Once we get the point clouds, once we get the point clouds, okay, uh, I shall not get into, uh, once we get the point clouds, I'm skipping this, I think. Uh, so we get the point clouds. Once we get the 3D point cloud, this 3D point cloud is on the basis of, so let's look into this way, our eyes, are stereoscopic eyes. Because of the two images, we get the 3D. Now, if I take images all around, I can create that stereoscopy multi-image reconstruction to get the point cloud. And this point cloud has a challenge in terms of matching. So deep learning actually solves the matching problem in a better way. When I do that, because, if, because I, I can see the depth because there is a match between the images and there is a lateral shift. The lateral shift actually is indicated of a depth of a point. So if I get multiple images and I do that, so I get the lateral shift, the depth of points which are in 3D space. Once I get the depth of the points in the 3D space, what happens is I can create a 3D point cloud representation. And from the 3D point cloud, I can extract features. There are point nets which are based on that, 
I don't need to create a 3D model, but point cloud itself, I can extract the features. And based on extraction of the, those features, I can evaluate the quality of the canopy, the characteristics of the canopy. And that with, with, with reference to standard classification schemes, you can do it. But the challenge is what? That in such a case that if we isolate, do an isolated planned analysis, how do I create a 3D model to look at it? In most of the cases, we work with 2D images, but 3D is actually gives me the much better understanding of the canopy architecture and the effect of the stress on the plant. So, uh, so this part I, I shall uh, skip. Then the other, what is interesting thing is that we are looking at is the, how do you look at desert farming? And we did some experiments being in IIT Jodhpur closer to third. We did some experiments and uh, essentially looking into the different factors. If you see that there are different issues in terms of uh, heat restrained species, and then these are also have sensors for heat. Based on that, they have the characteristics. And what is very interesting is that soil crust, which actually represents a kind of a ecosystem to support the plants to growth. And there are a number of, number of orga, uh, organisms which are in the plant crust, okay? So if you see, this is the crust, and we actually did a bioprospecting of the class, crust, and using metagenomics, we were trying to look at a genomic, uh, a kind of a bioinformatic model to suggest how an ecosystem of a plant can be created for its growth in a desert biosystem, in an arid ecosystem. So this is a very interesting problem. In fact, we did analysis of some of these trees, which are uh, khejri, say for example, is a typical desert tree. And looking into the structure of its root and this biota around that, using bioinformatics, as well as this kind of uh, physical measurements, we try to create a model for a uh, for actually a desert economics, because that's also a very interesting point to look at because most of the cases we create situation in a synthetic scenarios. But we, when you move to the field, the understanding of the field is much, uh, is much richer because we found that this soil crust and the metagenomics of the elements of the soil crust is actually has a very distinct characteristics in terms of supporting the desert plants. The last part I would like to touch upon is, I think five minutes I have, uh, uh, is, is a causal inference. Why? Because all of these which I talked about is a very traditional AI things, okay, in terms of analysis. And I have flagged that one of the addresses problems to be addressed. And I've used, as I told you, I, my, uh, I have picked up application. One is computer vision applications that have illustrated how computer vision can be used. We said that we shall just try to address the arid zone cultivation and their metagenomics becomes a tool to be used with AI and other observations. So there are a number of tools. The question is, AI is a collection of tools. And when we bring, look at AI in agriculture, we have to pick up the tools which are most appropriate for the problem at hand. And I gave example also the advisory as a chat GPT. The last thing that I'm looking at is what is called causal inference. In fact, today, this is a major work which is happening in ML is also what is called causal learning. Why causal learning? Because it's very important for me to establish what I am suggesting, why I am suggesting. Take, for example, a problem for agricultural recommendations. The causal inference with observational data has been the subject of recent work in diverse disciplines, in fact, including agriculture. And digital agricultural recommendations in many cases lack experimental validations because those are predictions. Predictions are based on the past data and that drift, which we actually talk about, can have impact on it. And what happens is that and observational causal, therefore, we need to look at these recommendations going beyond standard deep learning. So an observational causal inference framework can fill this gap by emulating the experiment we would have liked to do. Okay, that means if I am doing, an, uh, doing a recommendation, 
can I do an experiment and after that do a recommendation which is not practical? But can I create a, a reasoning model for doing those kind of things? Okay. So uh, look at this, that uh, what we are talking about, that uh, an example here is uh, the problem that we look at is, which has been is a very common problem in agriculture is recommendation for sowing time is critical for many crops. And it's a function of soil temperature, soil moisture, ambient temperature during the first day after sowing. And these play a crucial role in proper germination and emergence and ultimately determine the yield and its quality. Now we need and we use a multi-parametric forecast model. Now these forecast models in many cases are simple time series kind of predictions. We use a, mo we a model and today typical even uh, with, with learning framework also, we create a predictive learning models. Now, this predictive learning models is just, if you look into it, is just statistical correlation. But statistical correlations does not take care of the possible drifts or causation. There's a very distinct difference between correlation and causation. So therefore, when we are suggesting a swing time with respect to various parameters, we are actually going into the physics of the problem. Actually, there is a physics of the problem which suggests that this should be the correct swing time. And the physics of the problem means there has to be a causal model and not just correlation model. So therefore, the whole point is that you are moving from a correlational model to a causal model to a more sophisticated inferencing and prediction framework. So if you look into it, this uh, uh, there has been this work on this is a basic framework. I've tried to explain the basic framework. This framework is, let's say, I encode a farm system in the form of a directed acyclic graph. So, so far we have seen data, input data, output data, but now we're getting into a graph-based representation of farming itself. I said that digitalization is digitization of the processes. So if you look at the farming, the graph-based representation is digitalization of the farming process. And, and when we do that, what we say that the directed ages in a, in a graph, A to B, indicates causation from A to B. A causes B. And in the sense that changing the value of A and holding everything else constant will change the value of B. Now, this is something very, very important to observe, that changing everything keeping everything else constant, if I change A, B will change. So this is an assumption of working with, okay? And this is, and, and therefore what we do is, we define an operator in that graph, which is say a do operator. So what, and we represent it that the probability of Y to take a value small Y, when I take an action that is assigned small T to T, so therefore, it denotes the probability that the observable y would have a value y, given that we intervene on the system by setting the value of a variable t to t. So now these, these observables are therefore, the point is, I therefore convert the graph into an active inferencing network where these interventions can actually be applied and see what could be the possible action if I have the causal network operating. So what do we say that variable T of which we aim to estimate the effect as treatment and the variable Y which we want to quantify the impact of T on as outcome. The parents of note are its direct causes while a parent of both the treatment and outcome is referred to as common cause or conf uh, co confounder. So therefore there are confounder nodes and direct dependent nodes. Because if I keep my confounders constant, then I can estimate the effect of do operator much better way. But the moment I start using the confounder, the confounder impacts the effect of treatment. Now that model is something which is a very important causal model to look at, make the causal inferencing practical to the situations and scenarios which emerge. A very simple representation is that average treatment effect 
that is it's an expected value when i assign t to a positive and it's minus when i assign d t to zero that means when i'm taking an action this is when i'm not taking an action so it's an average treatment expectation treatment effect so why this treatment effect if i can estimate at the treatment effect then i can do kind of a simulated experiments on the basis of the causal network that i have so this is something is just take an example of this causal graph this is a causal graph where if you look into it we have looked at number of variables which are linked to the crop swing and there are multiple nodes and there are dependents now once we have dependents there are there are if you look into it there are nodes which are uh, we which which has a direct impact the nodes which does not have a direct impact and there there is a relationship between them so on this node if i now start taking this interventional effects so therefore if i if if i if i have this effect then if i if i apply a value t then what will be the impact in this different observations in the farm so this whole causal graph therefore i am representing the farm system as a causal graph the inputs are to the nodes based on my observations and suggestions are what actions i can take based on these actions that i can take i can get an expected value of the impact that ate is an expected value of impact depending on taking action and not taking action so therefore when i make a recommendation i can say that with reference to these these parameters i am suggesting this recommendation therefore we we also enlist the two actions okay so therefore the picture is much more clearer and detailed when it is being given to an end user to use so it's not it's a not a blind situation so therefore there are many uh, therefore there is an explanation with respect to which i am giving the data so the process is the ata we aim to estimate captures the difference between what the average yield would have been if we intervened and forced farmers to follow the recommendation by sowing on a favorable day and the average yield if we force them to defy the recommendation by sowing on an unfavorable day this is actually i have mapped what the do action as a swing okay and based on that and and representing the farming as a graph i have tried to estimate what would have been if you would not have swayed so therefore there is a very clear cut picture in terms of the data that we have and also of the impact of executions but here it is simpler because what i have not considered what is called counterfactuals okay any reasoning that we do is also with reference to counterfactuals counterfactuals are what are, it is what if reasoning in fact this is actually an indicator of what if reasoning that if i take this action what will happen if i don't take this up action what will happen happen but with reference to confounding variables also we can take this what if reasoning and create a kind of a framework with counterfactuals and in fact this is where the whole ai is moving today when we talk about the gap between causality and learning so how do we evaluate the outcome see we have all this we have already got the learning we we'll see the outcome that i i suggest that there is a disease but how do we evaluate the outcome because there are wild environments unknown environments for which i am actually providing the service so there is a high dimensional data which is there highly noisy and little prior knowledge because mod model specification and confounding structures of that place is always not known so therefore therefore we need to have what is called understanding versus prediction typical deep learning based models is what is predictions and therefore depth versus scale and performance is fundamental fundamental today and therefore the challenge is how to bridge the gap between causality and stable learning because stable learning why stable learning comes in because we know the moment there is a drift you know you refer to the uh, locational drift but data drift change in uh, uh, distributions actually make your learning unstable so how do you deal with that 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 is how the causality and unstable learning is to be looked at causality very clearly says that this is a noise this is not to be looked at 
but a learning model does not distinguish a noise in the data and makes inference making use of the noise. And hence, in many cases, it is unstable and gives random errors when you use it without taking this understanding in fact. So therefore, there has been lots of work which has been done that structural causal models. In fact, structural causal model, the graphical model that I've shown, I have hand constructed that model, but now there are machine learning algorithms to construct such models, okay? And then influencing on those models, and these are structural causal models, a very uh, mathematical representation, and which the core of the model is that directional graph. The graph that I have shown, the directional association graph is a key more key element of the structural causal model. And we can learn the structural causal models. And there are various algorithms and techniques which are being used there. And, and once we can learn the structural causal models, we can get into also, uh, there is also with reference to that, I have not touched that, there is a counterfactual causal model. You can also learn the counterfactual causal models. You can learn the structural causal models and create an inferencing system which actually simulates. It's a thought experiment. Just look at it, do it, and, and looking into what if experiments are actually thought experiments. And that gives me a very powerful machine learning paradigm which makes observations, but not observations without explanations. It makes observations taking into account the actions, what the, what the consequence of your actions would be, and what will be also impact of confounding variables. And in fact, that's where today's digital agriculture has to move in. And in fact, internationally also, there has been lots of recommendation work as is being done in that space. And I think today what we have done on the basis of the phenomics, computer vision, and those kind of data, we need to put across into kind of a causal structural model and use that for a variety of reason experiments. In fact, in medical domain, it has been done because say, say for example, when you look at Alzheimer's, there are not enough data for different Alzheimer's cases, but actually using the causal model and making use of generative AI, they've created those cases. And with reference to those cases, they have uh, compared actual patient data to make a conclusions, which is logically reasoned. I think that's where the AI is moving today. And we, with the data, with the big data, which is available, really if we and need to have this kind of a strong support for agriculture system with AI, we need to really invest our time, effort, and energy to causal models based on data and deliver services based on causal models, as well as the generative models, which actually makes use of language technology in a big way. This is my conclusion. Thank you.